In practical uses of semiconductors, we have to consider the non-equilibrium situation because in general, the semiconductors will not be in equilibrium. That's the case whenever a current is passing through the semiconductor. It's also the case when you have photoionization going on. That is, light is striking the semiconductor and exciting electrons into the conduction band. When you are not in equilibrium, the Fermi energy may not be horizontal. So when you are not in equilibrium, this nice expression that the n sub i, the intrinsic carrier concentration, equals square root of NP does not really hold. So we have to start to look at what's going on outside of equilibrium. To do that, first let's begin with the review of some electrostatics. Remember the relationship between electric field and electric potential. Electric field is minus the gradient of electric potential. Here we have it just in one dimension. One of the nice things about uh, semiconductor device physics is that we can quite often just do one-dimensional electrostatics. The electric field is this funny E, and V is the electric potential, the volts, at the specific location. I can also talk about energy. If I have a charge, big Q, in that electric field, there's energy. And then I can talk about the difference in the potential energy between two points in space for that charge, big Q. And that's the work done moving that charge between those two points in space. So the difference in potential energy between two points is minus the work done, minus f dot dx. And it's electrostatic, so force is charge times electric field. That's uh, something you learned with Coulomb's law once upon a time. And so the delta energy is minus qe delta x, something to keep in mind. Big Q now is just the charge. And in semiconductor devices, we usually just have two different charges we talk about, plus little q and minus little q, the charge of a hole or the charge of an electron. So big Q is most usually going to be one of those two things. That's where just a rearrangement gives us a nice working equation we're going to, going to take with us. That electric field is minus 1 over the charge times the gradient of energy. If I happen to know the electric field, I can calculate the gradient in energy, or, or if I know the gradient in energy, I can calculate the electric field. You may also remember from your general physics that there is this connection between electric field and the, the gradient of energy. Uh, and th that has this, this useful implication, that is that the gradient of electrostatic potential, dv by dx, is therefore related to the gradient of energy, where energy, E, is going to be either the, the conduction band edge or the valence band edge. And since we're talking about the rate of change with x, it won't matter because they both will always do the same thing. And this box equation is, is a keeper for you right now. It relates that gradient in potential to a gradient in energy. In terms of the charge, which is either the charge of an electron or a hole. Let's look at a specific application of this. If we connect a battery across a semiconductor, delta V being the potential difference across the battery terminals, and uh, we have the positive terminal of the battery connected to the left side of the semiconductor, and usually by convention you ground the negative terminal of the DC power source. That way you have a place where you can actually say V equals zero. And that's, uh, that's oftentimes a convenient thing to do when analyzing uh, the device performance. So if I made a graph of a potential across the semiconductor as a function of location across the semiconductor, it's going to go from some high number, the positive terminal of the battery, to zero, uh, which is the negative terminal of the, of the source. I'll draw it like this. It starts out at delta V, which is the voltage of the battery and it goes to zero when it arrives at the other side of the semiconductor. And so that's my potential versus position along the semiconductor. It's just a straight line with a negative slope. Now let's talk about energy, and we'll plot that on the, the right vertical axis. Remember, if we had our little expression that makes energy have the opposite slope as V. That is, the gradient of energy is opposite in sign to the gradient of V for an electron. And so if I graph and electrons energy anywhere inside of here, it will have a positive slope going up. A few takeaways then from this graph is that you notice where the potential is more positive, the energy is lower, and where the potential is more negative, that is lower, the energy is higher. 
So energy goes in the opposite way as potential. So and that makes sense because an electron does not want to be near a negative potential. It does not want to be where the potential is low. It wants to be where the potential is high. So that's where the potential energy of the electron will be minimized. Keep this uh, operating principle in mind. We can do the same graph for holes. All you would do if, if there were, we were talking about a hole in here instead of an electron is you take this orange curve for the electron energy and you, ch you switch its slope, change the sign of the slope, and plot it that way. But, but we never do that. In semiconductor physics, whenever you see an energy level diagram, an energy band diagram, the energies that are shown are always an electron energy, unless otherwise stated. But it, that's what we do. We do electron energies. Let's illustrate it with this little setup here. I have a slab of semiconductor, a length of delta x. I put plus 3 volts on one end and plus 6 volts on the other end. So there's a voltage drop of plus 3 volts, so a voltage increase of plus 3 volts as I go from left to right across the semiconductor. Let's go ahead and plot the energy uh, inside that semiconductor using what we just figured out. So if I dropped an electron inside the semiconductor, where does it want to go? You know, it wants to go to where the potential is higher. That's what electrons want to do. So the potential energy has to be smallest at the right end because, you know, stuff goes downhill when it comes to energy. Uh, things are attracted to where the energy is the lowest. And so that's what the energy level diagram looks like. And I'll just arbitrarily call it E sub C. <laughs> this is what the conduction band edge inside the semiconductor is going to do. I can even figure out, you can figure out, <laughs> how much it drops. And let's talk through that. Let's figure out the actual energy change as we go from the left end to the right end. Using one, one more thing to remind you about from general physics, potential is defined as potential energy per unit charge. Potential energy is charge times potential, or a, a change in energy is charge times a change in potential. If you know the potential difference and you want to know the energy difference, you just have to multiply it by the charge that is going to cross that potential difference. We always talk about electrons, so let's use an electron. The electron charge minus little q. So the energy drop is minus little q times delta v. Delta v is 3 volts, remember, so let's use that. So I have minus q 3 volts. If I replace q now with 1.6 times 10 minus 19 coulombs, I will have the energy drop in joules, which we don't use. So this entire course is in electron volts. What does that mean? That means you leave this. You don't put the number in for this Q. You just pick it up and move it over in front of the V, and then you change it from Q to E to be consistent with what everybody in the world does, and you call it an electron volt, and that's the unit of energy. You replace that little E with 1.697 minus 19, and you will have the energy in joules. So we have minus 3 electron volts energy change going across the semiconductor. Let's make an energy level diagram. How do you do that? Well, we've already started. We just did the conduction band edge. I'm going to start fresh because there's, I don't know why, I just am. So the valence band edge has to do exactly the same thing. It is very hard to change a band gap. It doesn't change just because you apply a voltage across the semiconductor. And so the band gap has to be maintained all the way across. That's very important to remember. The Fermi energy is going to follow the same thing because current is flowing through the semiconductor. It just is. You've applied a voltage. It has a conductivity. Current's going through it. And when current goes through it, the Fermi energy will most likely follow the conduction and valence bands and do what they do. But not always. Um, so right now we're showing it doing this because we're not in equilibrium, because there's current going through the semiconductor. Well, I'm showing the Fermi energy going down. In the event that we're in equilibrium, that would mean there's no current going through the semiconductor and the Fermi energy will be horizontal. We have an example problem coming up where that's the case, and my first thing I'm going to do is ask you, why do you think that's the case here? I'll reiterate one more time, these slants would just be opposite if it were holes that we're talking about, but we always talk about the electrons in semiconductors. One last thing, as long as we're reviewing a little bit of E and M, is I'll throw a new idea at you, unless you've seen it before, um, and that's Poisson's equation, which gives you a gradient of electric field as a function of charge density. So if you are inside a cloud of charge, which semiconducting devices are full of, 
uh, you have a gradient in the electric field, E, uh, which is the charge density divided by the permittivity of the semiconductor. And sorry about the very similar symbols here, but these are not electric fields. These are symbols for epsilon naught. Uh, well, here, I'll go through everything. So this, the slanted E is the electric field. I'm following our book's notation. Density rho is uh, the space charge that you'll hear the word space charge used a lot. It's the charge density in space, the coulombs per cubic centimeter. Then these epsilons, I'll call them epsilons. Uh, the reason for using a squiggly E in our textbook is because obviously you're not going to use a capital E for electric field in a book that's full of energy. Right? So that's that's why. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, which uh, we're going to put in farads per centimeter, unless you want it in farads per meter, in which case you'd have a 12 and not a 14. And epsilon sub r is the dielectric constant. And uh, it's these numbers for these materials. There is a table in the back cover of your textbook that lists the dielectric constants for these and other materials. You can consult that as needed. Suppose I have a slab of silicon, maybe a long transmission line uh, made out of silicon, and it's filled up with a uniform charge distribution, and X is where you're at here, so X is zero at the left end, and it's just, I guess, bigger as you move to the right. I can uh, use Poisson's equation to write an expression for electric field as a function of X, simply by integrating it, I should say from zero to X, but integrating it so you have this, you know, rho over the permittivity times where you're at, times x, plus the constant of integration. And what we will be doing in chapter 4 is applying appropriate boundary conditions to get that constant of integration so that this actually becomes useful to us. Okay, so we'll return to this in chapter 4. I didn't want you to be surprised by it when you see it then, in case you haven't seen it before. So I wanted to get you sort of warmed up for Poisson's equation now. Um, okay, I'll talk to you later.